Okay, and we're live. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for another MSU Science Festival Afternoon Science Snack. My name's Catherine. I'm also joined by Roxanne from the Science Festival. Hi, and everyone. Today, <laughs> and today we're also joined by Ruth Ann Jones from MSU's Libraries. Hi, how are you? I'm good, thank you. And we're excited to have you. I'm excited to make our own books. Um, before we start, would you mind introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about your role at the library? Sure. I'm Ruth Ann Jones, and I am the education, oh, excuse me, I just changed my title, instruction and outreach librarian for special collections at the MSU libraries. So special collections is the unit that has rare books. Um, we also have a lot of popular culture. Um, we have a big radicalism collection. And among our rare books, we have a genre that's called artist books. And that does not mean um, books that are photographs of art, like we would have in the art library. Um, those are just art books. <laughs> um, but artist books are ones that are handmade by artists. And so that's kind of where we're heading this afternoon. So what I do at the library is um, I'm in charge of um, teaching classes for students who are coming to special collections to learn how to use primary sources or to find out what types of material we have. Um, some of my other colleagues um, teach also, but um, I'm kind of the lead in that area. Um, they, they, uh, they have other main jobs and they teach on the side and I have teaching as my main job. Wonderful. Okay, okay. so I can get started. All right, um, the first thing I'm gonna do is share my screen to show you a PowerPoint I did to show some of the artist books that we have in special collections. And the first book that we're going to be making is called an accordion book. And once we make it, you'll be like, wow, that was so simple. Well, it is very simple, it's deceptively simple, but that type of book has a very, very long history. And the book that you're looking at right now is a picture of a reproduction that we have of a manuscript, manuscript that is held in the Vatican Library. So manuscript means it was made by hand, and that means there's only one like it. So only the Vatican has it. But there is a company in Spain that um, makes very beautiful and very accurate museum quality reproductions of manuscripts that then libraries can buy so that their students can see something that is 99.9% .9 like the original. Um, and honestly, ours is just so amazing. It's, it has um, even the wear and tear on the manuscript is reproduced. Um, I think if I told you that this was real, um, a lot of people would, would think that, that it was real. Um, so this is a reproduction of a manuscript that was made by the Aztecs sometime before the year 1500, which is before the uh, Spanish colonizers uh, conquered the, air, the peoples in Mexico. Uh, so this is in the Nahuatl language. Um, it's technically called Codex Borgia because that's what the Vatican calls it. But in the Nahuatl language, it would be called, and I'm sure I'm not going to pronounce this properly, but Codex Yoali Ehecatl. And Codex is a Latin word that means book. Um, and I read an article by a scholar who said that night of, dark, of wind and darkness would be um, an appropriate English translation for that. So this accordion format goes back many, many centuries. The next one that's showing, um, all the rest of the, the things are, are more contemporary. This is an artist book by a woman named Laura Davidson. It's called Random Thoughts on Hope. And you can see the similarity to the last book we looked at. It's a simple accordion structure, so it can stand up by itself. The slide that I'm showing now is another accordion book by one of my favorite artists, Jenna Rodriguez, that's called Running Thoughts. And I had a couple of pictures of this, but I picked the one where we're looking down at the uh, accordion book. So you could see that she actually used both sides of the paper. And so when you have this stretched out on a table, 
you have to walk all the way around it in order to see everything that the artist wanted you to see. So there's like sort of a physical aspect to experiencing this book. You can't just sit still in your chair. You have to get up and, and actually walk around the book to see everything that's there. So this is the first of the uh, formats that we're going to make this afternoon. Um, and then, uh, whoops, sorry, that was a, um, I went too fast. Okay, um, the last book related to accordion books, um, I'll show a little sample of this too. Once you know how to make an accordion book, you are one step for making something called a flag book. And that's what this is, Laura Russell's book, Oh Say Can You See, um, which is not only the structure is called a flag, but in fact, she has been, she in this book, she's meditating on the American flag. Okay, the next structure that we're going to do is called a threefold one cut book. And um, I had to take pictures myself <laughs> of what I had at home, samples that I made at um, Science Festival because I didn't have any photographs on my computer of um, threefold one cut books that are in our collection. But um, here are a couple ones that I did for Science Festival last year to show kids what the book would look like when they had it all folded. Um, and the one on the right, actually, um, my niece made that one for me for Science Festival because she, um, she wanted to play with the dark paper and the metallic ink. So she made me a little book about space to, to um, use for Science Festival. And then the last thing, um, I hope we'll have time to look at, to, to show how to do this format. This is similar to the threefold one cut book, but it is more folds and more cuts. Um, and it yields a 12 page book instead of a, an eight page book. Um, so this is um, a book called Walking by Megan Koss, who's this, actually a student. We have a lot of stuff from students in our collection. Um, and I also just admire how well my colleague Shelby Krosky um, was able to capture the beauty of this book and her photography because it is just made on like uh, photocopier paper and, and highlighting pens, um, but it is really an interesting piece. Okay. So let me stop sharing now. And we're going to look at how to make an accordion book. So, excuse me. Um, what do you need to make any of these books? You just need three things. You need paper. It can be construction paper. It can be uh, photocopier paper. Um, it can be um, rectangular works well, but it doesn't have to be. It could be square. You need a pair of scissors. And um, to do it online like this, I use tape. Um, normally, I would glue my book together, but then I would have to wait for the glue to dry. <laughs> so since I'm doing this live, um, I'm going to use tape. So if you want to follow along with me, you just need a piece of paper, some tape, and a pair of scissors. So now I'm going to adjust my computer camera so that you can see my desk. Okay, so I've got a piece of nine by 12 construction paper. And while I was uh, waiting for us to start, I went ahead and did the first fold on this so I wouldn't be uh, fretting about it online. And so the very first thing we're going to do with this rectangular construction paper is make a fold down the middle along the long end. So I'm folding it over again, and I'm using my fingernail to make that crease nice and sharp. And then you could either cut this, or in fact, this paper is relatively soft texture, so I'm just going to quickly tear it. So now I've got two pieces of paper that are pretty long, thin rectangles. And I'm going to tape them together to make an even longer rectangle. And of course, like I said, um, it's nicer if you just use some glue, <laughs> but um, we would be very bored if we had to sit here and wait for the glue to dry. Like that expression about watching paint dry. Watching glue dry is not very interesting. Okay, so I taped it together 
And so now I have a really long, thin piece of paper. <laughs> and I just knocked over my little bowl of blueberries here. So they're rolling across my desk. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is take this long, thin piece of paper and fold it in half so that it's back to approximately the shape and, and proportions of the um, paper when I first uh, ripped it in half. So now I've got this uh, piece that's got one fold. Now I'm going to simply fold it again. And again, I'm gonna use uh, my fingernail or you could also use the edge of your scissors to make that crease nice and sharp. And then I'm going to fold it a third time. Now, the number of folds that you do really depends on the size of your paper. If you had a sheet of paper that was like six feet long, you could do more folds. Um, it's up to you. This is a very flexible uh, format. Okay, so now I've got this piece of paper that has been folded all these times. I'm going to stretch it out again. And we're going to use these folds, but we want to refold some of the directions of the folds so that it makes a zigzag. And actually, I forgot that I have a little sample here to um, make sure that you can see the zigzags. Okay, that looks good. So this is a little sample book I made with pictures of my cat. <laughs> because I was thinking, well, what craft materials do I have? I have plenty of cat pictures. So we're gonna make that zigzag. We're gonna make this into that kind of a zigzag. So the first fold is okay. It doesn't really matter which way you start, but now I'm going to refold the other one. Some of these are gonna to have to be folded backwards from, from the way they originally were. Okay, so now I have a zigzag. And so I could make a book out of that, like my book of cat pictures. Another thing that you could do is use a strip of a map. Actually, that's gonna be kind of hard to understand. Use a strip of a map to make an accordion book. So here you can see the zigzags so you could ask your uh, adults in your family if they've got a roadmap that's outdated and then cut a long strip out of that. And then that would be a very cool background for a book. Um, in fact, if it was maybe a roadmap for a trip you took or a national park that you visited, you could use that book to put pictures of your trip or something. There's lots and lots of things that you can do. And the material that you use can be in the same theme as the content of your book. I also mentioned that once you've made an accordion book, you're one step from making a flag book. So here is a little flag book that I made, again, using a strip of a map. And I just pasted some, you know, some green <laughs> things on there to be the flags. But basically that's all a flag book is. It's an accordion book and then it has additional pieces um, glued on that extend beyond the front folds so that you've got, when it's folded, you've just got these little things here. But when you unfold it, you've got this amazing um, display of all of these pieces of paper that are waving around. <laughs> okay, so that's an accordion book. And now, I'm coming back up so that I can share my screen and walk through with you how to, what we're going to do with the threefold one cut book. Okay. Oh, great. It's still on the large thing. Okay. So the first step of the threefold one cut book, again, we're going to um, generally do this with rectangular paper. It doesn't really matter, but um, rectangular works nicely. It doesn't have to be any certain size or, or, or proportions. And the first thing we're gonna do is fold it in half, just like we did before actually, 
down the long side of the paper. We're not gonna cut it though, we're just gonna fold it. Then the next thing that we're going to do is unfold that and fold it again down the short side of the paper. So number two is the second step that we're gonna do. And then again, we're going to unfold it so that we can see the whole sheet. And the third thing that we're gonna do is fold from the edge into the middle. Um, it's in a way you could call this a fourfold book because the third fold actually happens two times, but it's the same concept. So I guess that's why it has gotten to be known as a threefold book. Okay, so then when we look at the paper, we'll be able to see these creases um, that the paper has been divided into eight different segments. Okay, the next, oh, sorry, those arrows were to show that we're folding from the edge of the paper to the middle of the paper. Okay, then the next thing we're going to do is cut along that very first fold from point A to point B. But we're not going to try to do that by like stabbing the, the, the point of your scissors into the paper to get yourself started. What we're gonna do is fold the paper in half and then cut from the crease to the middle point the middle of what you're seeing now. It's actually one of those third folds that you made that is one quarter of the way from, from, from part of the paper, okay? So now let's do that live. Live from New York, except I'm not in New York, I'm in East Lansing. Okay, so let's take a nice piece of, of uh, light yellow paper for this. So. The very first thing that I'm going to do is, I'm turning this so that it's convenient for me as a right-hander, um, and I'm gonna fold down the long edge of the paper and make the crease nice and sharp. Making books by hand, we keep always saying, make the crease nice and sharp. <laughs> Um, yeah, that really helps your book come out nicely. Um, and also being really, really as careful as you can to get the corners to match up um, will help your book um, uh, turn out nicely too, um, so that the um, different corners that have to meet each other match up. Okay, so I just did the second step where I folded it down the middle the short way. Now I'm going to fold from the edge into the middle and unfold that one and then turn it around and do that again. Okay, so now um, it may, hopefully you can see with the shadows on the paper that I now have my paper divided into, um, you can see that it's got eight segments because of all the creases. Okay, now we're gonna cut. I've got my scissors. And remember, this is, a, a student had to show me this years ago. I was like, oh, okay, now you stab your scissors into here and then cut from there. And they're like, oh, these little librarians really need some help from somebody who's used to working with paper. And so I folded it in half and the edge of the papers here the crease is on this side and the open flaps are on this side. And so I'm going to cut and I'm going to stop right here. Okay, now this is the part that's kind of hard, but it's so cool. I've now got my paper with this slice down the middle. I'm going to fold it up again the long way. And then I'm going to push from the ends so that I have sort of a diamond in the middle. And this is where your nice sharp creases will help you and you might still have to um, crease a little bit. And so you push it all the way until you have something that's like a plus sign. Then move your hand 
so that you are wrapping one of those sections around the other. And that is your eight page book. And I've got one now that I made already that has the page numbers on it so that we can unfold this and look at how it looks. So page one is a very boring book. All it has is page numbers. Pages two and three, pages four and five, pages six and seven, and then page eight. And now if I unfold this, you can see that all of the pages are on one side of the sheet of paper. And that if you wanted to do all of your decoration or writing your book before you did all the folding, um, then this will tell you the order that things need to be. Um, you can actually, let me fold this up again. Once you have the book made into a plus sign like this, you can wrap any of the sections around the other. So here I wrapped it where page two is on one end and page three. That would be a little confusing. Um, it doesn't really matter just that if you have already put your content on the paper, when you're holding the plus sign, you need to find the part that has the front page and the back page. And that is the section that you're going to wrap around the others. Okay. And I have so many little samples on my desk that I am, okay, here we go. <laughs> it's getting confusing here. So here's a book that I made that's an, uh, of, of a book like this that actually has content. So it's, um, it's just a little miniature atlas. It has the world. It has the United States with uh, Michigan in red. Then it has Michigan with an arrow pointing to East Lansing. And then it has a little map of Lansing and East Lansing. And then it has the MSU library logo because we're within East Lansing. So if I unfold this one, you can see here's the first page and here's the last page. And then these are the, the, um, the uh, what we would call spreads in each, the um, a content that goes across two pages that are open together. Okay, so how are we doing for time? I'm going to, that was kind of a rhetorical question. <laughs> I was looking at the <laughs> clock on my computer. <laughs> I'm going to share my screen again and show you a little bit about how to make the 14 page or 12 page book. It's you can call it either 12 or 14, depending on how you count where the cover starts. OK, so this was the last of our threefold book. And actually, I had a diagram to help you see what to do with the last step of that one. And I'm sorry, I forgot to show it. OK. Now this one, I, I it, it is, it's really complex drawing this one. So I did not make multiple slides. All I was able to do was um, show you the fold lines and then the next slide is gonna be the cutting lines. So um, for this book, um, again, we're gonna take a rectangular piece of paper and the red horizontal lines are your first set of folds. It's one third of the way across. So you can either use a ruler to exactly measure your piece of paper um, from here down to here and then divide by three and make little pencil marks and so forth. You can also eyeball it. Um, and some people can do that easily and other people it's kind of hard. So Whichever works for you is just fine. Then the next thing that we're going to do, of course, we'll unfold the paper like we always did. Whoops. Um, we will fold the paper in half down the middle on the short side like we did before. And we will then open it up and fold the edges into the middle like we did before. So in, this is quite similar to the other book. 
But then the next thing that we're going to do is make two scissor cuts and they're going to go almost all the way across. They're gonna, each cut is gonna go three quarters of the way across, okay? So that was my last slide. So now I'm gonna show you um, how to do this. And in this case, I did not pre-fold my paper. So I am totally going to have to eyeball this. However, I have had pretty good luck with that in the past. And so I'm just gonna, well, not this time. Let's refold that just a little bit. Okay. So now I have my paper folded in thirds. And of course, because we're online, um, you know, I might be very happy to use the ruler, but I don't want to take the time while we're doing this live. So it is a little off, but I know that you'll forgive me. Okay, so I've got my piece of paper that's divided into three long sections. Now I'm going to fold it in half the short way. Make a nice sharp crease, open it up, and then I'm going to fold each edge into the middle. Open it up, flip it around, and do that again. Okay, so ignore the fact that, that um, there's a little bit of extra folding there, but essentially you're looking at this and you've got 12 sections. So now we're going to cut the paper starting here all the way to there. And then on the other long fold, we're gonna start here and cut all the way to there. Okay, so let's see if I can do this while making sure that it's all visible to the camera on my computer. Okay, so I cut the first one three quarters of the way down. Now I'm gonna flip it around and on the other side, I'm going to flip three quarters of the way down. Sorry, I'm gonna flip the paper and then I'm going to cut three quarters of the way down. I don't know what I said, but it probably wasn't right. Okay, so now we've got a paper that is sort of like a capital N um, or actually an upside down capital N. And so the, um, trick to putting this one together is a little bit like the accordion. We have creases already, all the places that we want to have folds, but some of them we need to um, fold them backwards so that they're going in the opposite direction. So I'm gonna start with this one and then I'm gonna fold that one is going the other way. So the idea is that you're never wrapping paper around folded paper. You're always just folding one face of the paper to the next face. Okay, so now we get to a place. What do we do? The paper is going the other direction. Well, we're just going to fold it down and then go backwards again and fold and fold. And here we are again with our changing directions. What do we do? We're just gonna fold down here and keep going. And so now we have a book that has 12 sheets on the inside. And if you want to consider both the front and back of these edge pieces, then it, you could call it 14 pages. And so this is like the last book that I showed on my slide. And I also have one that has um, the numbers on it so that you can kind of see where the pages are. Um, this is actually, it's on bigger paper, so I'm not sure it'll fit into the screen, but um, I'll move it around. And so this is a book like that where 
the um, I just went through and numbered the pages so that I could see where they where they laid. And this is one where I put number one on the other side and then number two. And so here you can see that the numbers are all upside down. And then here they flip to going sideways. And then the numbers are in the correct position and then they're upside down again. <laughs> so that is a really fun book. The uh, one that I showed you on the slide, uh, you may remember that I said it was made by a student. Um, the book is called Walking and the student who made that book, the, the, the subject of her book was, um, this was about 20 years ago when um, uh, there were very few laptops and people just used desktop computers. And so the people in um, information technology sometimes had to walk around campus to go to people's office to help them with their computer because they couldn't just pick up their laptop and bring it. And so her campus job was, was helping with that. And so she made a book about her long walks from one building to the next building, back to the IT center, off to another professor's office. And that was the content of her book was walking. And so this book that has all these different directions seemed to her like the perfect format to express how she felt about her daily job. So those are you get a bonus format. The, the ad for this uh, session said you learn how to make two books, but you actually learned how to make three. And so I am now ready for questions. Well, I was following along with you and I, evidently I did something wrong on my turns. My book did not quite turn out the same way. Oh no. But we'll go back and revisit it. That's the nice thing about this, that uh, the video will be on Facebook so I can walk back through later. Um, I did have a question uh, regarding um, special collections. Once the university mm -hmm. opens back up, where mm -hmm. are the special collections and can anybody go in and see them? Absolutely. Special Collections is open to everybody. You do not have to be enrolled at MSU or employed by MSU. Everybody is welcome there. The only difference is that when you sign up on our for an account on our registration system, um, you have to remember your password because everybody who is part of MSU, it uses their email password. <laughs> and so presumably they already have that one memorized <laughs> um, very, very well. Uh, if you're not at MSU, you have to make up a password and then you have to remember it. Um, other than that, everybody is welcome. And we do have people who come in and read comics. Um, occasionally local caterers come in and look at our cookbook collection, like if they've been um, hired to cater a special meal um, and they want some, some new ideas, things like that. Lots of people come to use the comics collection and we're very happy to have people come. Ooh, how far back do you go with your cookbook collection? I didn't know you had one. Um, we have um, several cookbooks that are in the range of 500 years old. Uh, we have one that was acquired within the last couple of years. I'm not sure if it's in Italian or in Latin, but it is by the gentleman who was in charge of cooking for the Pope uh, 500 years ago. Um, so very, very <laughs> amazing wow. stuff. We have um, a copy, we have several copies actually, different, different editions of the very first American cookbook, which um, there were cookbooks of course before that. This one came out in 1796, but all the cookbooks that existed in America before that, uh, either they had been imported from England or people had brought their own copies over when they settled in the United States. And so there were no cookbooks that had recipes for pumpkin or for cranberries or for corn. Um, and so this was the first cookbook to have a recipe for pumpkin pie or for anything using cranberries. Um, I always think how the um, people uh, first getting used to cooking with cranberries um, who came over from Europe must have been surprised at how much sweetener it took because they were used to um, only using berries like blueberries and raspberries that were not so sour. 
<laughs> yeah, that would be quite a shock. And I don't know where they would get the sweetener initially. Also, I guess way back. Yeah. So that That's would why be I didn't say sugar sweet. because I'm not sure if it was sugar. <laughs> I guess it would be honey or who knows. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, when, when you were making your book and you had the world, the world Atlas book, do you mm -hmm. use a template like out of Microsoft to format when you're making your book? I'm looking so, for my copy. Um, no, I just eyeballed that one too. Ah, okay. Um, and you know, I think I, I went and printed a copy on our, on our, a black and white copy on our print, our uh, machine in the, in special collections to see if anything was really off. I mean, folded it and then like, oh, okay, maybe the, the world is too, <laughs> too, 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 too uh, close to the edge or something. And then just tinkered with it a little and, and okay, I'm done. <laughs> okay. All right. I was hoping Microsoft would have that template available for you so you oh, could. <laughs> that's, that's not to say that they don't. They, they have yeah. a lot of really interesting things for making booklet printing and things like that. I just didn't. Yeah, <laughs> it's good to know you can, you don't need a template, you can do it on your own. That's awesome. You can um, put, you can make a grid on Microsoft documents. Um, and, and I often do that when I'm plotting um, how to, how to put visual elements on something. Awesome. That's a useful tip. Yeah. <laughs> Say again? I said, that's a useful tip to use the grid system to plan yeah. your the awesome. grid doesn't print. It's just there to guide your eye right, and your, right. your eye hand coordination. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we had a, just a couple of comments. Um, Scout was very appreciative of your talk and she said she has like a hundred cookbooks. So just she's Yay. <laughs> to hear about the cookbooks that the library has. Do you have any oh. idea of how many you guys have? Um, we have about 30,000. Oh, wow. But yeah, we don't, you know, stop and count all the time. But, you know, like every couple of years, we have the um, people who are in charge of the library catalog do a search for everything that has a certain subject heading and a certain location. And like, okay, that's about how many we have. <laughs> So about 30,000. <laughs> awesome. And I know for the Science Festival, you always bring out some really interesting science-themed books. What's your favorite um, old science book that you like to show people? I have two favorites. Um, my probably top favorite is we have a printing of, I'm not sure if I'm going to get the Latin right, but De Corporis Fabrica Humana. I'm sure that's not exactly right, but in English, it means on the fabric of the human body. It was written by a Dutch um, physician, scientist named Andreas Vesalius. That's not a Dutch name, but it was very uh, like important to scholars to make your name sound like it was in the Latin. So <laughs> the name he was known by was Andreas Vesalius. Um, and anyway, this book is the very first work of modern anatomy. Um, and all anatomical and medical knowledge up to that point, the first edition of this, I believe was 1547, something like that, um, was from the Greeks <laughs> from you know, 1200 or 14 or 1600 years before. Um, part of that is because um, after um, Christianity spread, um, it was considered very sinful to do a dissection of a human body. And so knowledge about anatomy kind of just stopped. Mm -hmm. um, the title page of this book has an image, not a photograph, of course, but a woodcut depicting Andreas Vesalius doing a dissection with many students looking on. Um, it's not a first edition. It's from about seven years after the first one came out, but he was still alive. So we know that he was involved in the, in the, the uh, revisions for the second edition. After he passed away, it was still being published and revised, but he was no longer directing that. So um, the one that I always think of at the same time is called Anatom Animalium, which is animal anatomy. That is from, a, think about, a, it's about 100 years later. I 
think 1681. And it is the first work of comparative zoology, comparative anatomy among animals. And it's also amazing. The illustrations on both of these books are really, really amazing. Um, uh, it's, and anyway, those are two of my favorites. <laughs> Awesome, awesome. And we did have a question. Alicia wanted to know, do different cultures have different types of books? Um, yes, actually, um, the, the, um, in the Middle East, the scroll is a traditional shape for a book. So if you think about the Torah scroll that would be used in a synagogue during worship, the scroll is the traditional format for a book. Um, some of the uh, that thing, some of those those um, traditional uh, traditions that grow up have to do with what material you're using. So um, another example in in this sort of area is if you ever look at a traditional Japanese book, um, especially one that's more than a hundred years old. Um, there's a certain way of binding it, but um, what is what you'll notice is that it's only printed is that the pages are folded in like this and it's only printed on those sides not on the inside the reason for that is that the vegetable the 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 veg, the, the plant material that is available in japan to make paper out of makes a much more porous paper than some of the plant material that's available in other parts of the world. And so the paper that's made with uh, plant material that's native to Japan, will, the ink bleeds through a lot more. And so on this inside surface here, um, you don't want to have your text because it'll be hard to read it because ink from these sides will have bled through. So a lot of, um, the, the, the way that things evolve um, depends on decisions like that. I have to say, I do not know the um, reason for the scroll versus the accordion book being, um, I don't know what differences in the native materials those are based on. Okay, great. Well, we only have a couple more minutes. Um, Catherine, did you have a question? Um, not, not any right now. Um, just want to thank you for that. I did make a couple. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> yeah, I, I, I pulled the last one, so um, there is a bit of a, a gap, but it, you know, it's unique and, and it's fun. So now I um, just have to figure out what what I'm gonna put in here. <laughs> so that was great. When I make them in front of a group, um, mine are always like, you know, the angles are quite off because I'm trying to fold really fast and at the same time, keep an eye on what everybody else is doing. <laughs> so, so then it looks like I really don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> well, it's, it's charming, you know, it's very evident that it was handmade and I appreciate that. So. <laughs> um, yes, I, I very much value the handmade aesthetic. Mm -hmm both in my professional life and in my personal life. <laughs> um, well, we are running out of time. Um, is there anything else that you wanna share with our audience before we um, sign out here? Please come to special collections. <laughs> the library will not be open again to the public until August because of the pandemic. Um, and we are um, part of the reason for that is we get crowds and crowds of people in the MSU library and so, the whole library is being, uh, you know, furniture being moved around and um, temporary walls being put up and everything so that we can safely reopen the library and um, accommodate social distancing. So um, it's not that we're just shut the door and walked away. Our facilities team is very hard at work <laughs> moving things around. Um, and when we open in August, we will be ready for lots of people to be using the building. So we, we miss you all very much. <laughs> and look forward to seeing you at the end of the summer. And I did have one late Barry King question that oh. maybe we can take just a quick minute. Um, Alicia wanted to know what types of books did people native to America have? Um, 
That is a question I'm not really qualified to answer very well. I know that many Native American groups did not have a written component to their language. They had very complex um, uh, spoken languages that I, a complex in the sense of linguists thinking of complex, like all the different verb tenses and conditional things and, and all of that. But many did not have a written component to their language. However, many native groups did have very um, sophisticated visual um, styles uh, of drawing. And so they did they did have the concept of putting marks on a surface and did that, but they, um, what I am aware of mostly is, I mean, what, what I know about mostly is the um, different visual um, styles. So, um, I mean, there's a big spectrum between um, alphabets that represent sounds and ideograms or pictographs that are a, a symbol or a character that represents a concept rather than the sound. And, and so you know what the meaning is, but then it doesn't tell you how to say it. You just know that from your culture. Um, and so I am sure that there was a visual language there. Um, and now I'm gonna have to go and look for a book about it. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. That's what the libraries are for. You have an idea and then you can go explore. Mm -hmm. Everyone yeah. should use their library. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. Um, and I can actually speak to that question a little bit. Um, if you want to do a little bit of future uh, research, look up ledger art. Um, a lot of Oh, yes. Very, very interesting. Um, a lot of beautiful work was created, um, artwork and um, different storytelling was uh, created on um, like a counting ledger paper. Um, so yeah, definitely check that out. Yes, yes, we have a, um, not a reproduction of a ledger book. Um, we have, there is a children's book published about 15 years ago called Thomas Blue Eagle, I believe. And it is a modern, um, like this is what a ledger book would have, a story that might very well be in a ledger book. And it's also made in that style. So the uh, ledger books, um, just to give a little bit of their history, um, children who were forcibly taken from their families in native um, tribes and made to go to schools to learn English, um, then they knew, then they had the um, skill of writing um, English, because that, they were learning to read and write in English and speak English. Um, they, the ledger books were a type of blank book that were widely available because that's what everybody did their bookkeeping in. Everybody who had a store or whatever needed ledger books to keep their records. Um, and so they would use a blank ledger book as the um, surface, the, the package to put their written and um, uh, drawings, written content in and their drawings. So yeah, the, those are both a sad and very beautiful um, genre. All right, well, on that note, I think we are out of time, but thank you, Ruth Ann, for being with us this afternoon. And I, there is a, a link on our, in the comments to go to our survey page and take a survey about the presentation tonight. And um, again, thank you so much, Ruth Ann. You're welcome, my pleasure. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye. Take care.